temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I'll fall on my knees Jesus you're my hope and stay It's when I cannot stand I'll fall on my knees Jesus you're my the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty or so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. sing for all that you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place Slay, worthy is the 
Praise the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, worthy, worthy, oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set. I sing for all that you've done for me. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you. None of us, Lord, help us. We pray that we would not think that somehow we could show up righteous before our Creator without your sacrifice. We don't have to. It wouldn't work anyway. Lord, we all know it. We're sinful human beings, Lord, but we serve God. You, a great, gracious, merciful God. We want to lift you high today. We want to worship you as people that believe. And we pray, Father, that you would minister to us. Help us, Lord. Grow in our faith. Grow stronger, Lord. We've all lived through this week, gotten pounded this way, pounded the other, failed this way, succeeded in another. Lord, we're, we're all over the place. And so we pray, God, that during this time that you would, you would receive our little loaves and fishes that we offer to you, and we ask that you would make it enough. Forgive us of our sins, cleanse our souls, we pray, and minister to us. Remind us of your great grace and your great love for us. May we lift you up and celebrate the cross, the sacrifice that you made, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to worship you today. And, Lord, we do, we, we pray for others that are, we pray for Andy and Lindy as they're away preparing for the youth camp. Uh, we pray for them. Help them, Lord, as they prepare. We pray for the youth camp this week. God, bless those leaders. Bless the youth in a special way. Bless the speaker. We pray for them. Lord, we pray for Tim Segrin, our one of our elders, Lord, as he preaches today. We pray for him and ask that you would speak to us. Give us insight into your word. To talk to us, Lord. Help us to to grasp the things that you want to say to us. Maybe you want to encourage us, and we need to receive it. Maybe you want to correct us, and we need to receive that. And so, Lord, we pray that you would have your will in our hearts and our souls, God, in our minds. Lord, what you do is good. What you do is good. And we want to praise you and worship you today in Jesus' name. A little amen from a baby there. There we go. Hallelujah. 
slave to sin. My life was bound and all my chains fell to the ground. When Jesus' blood came flowing down, hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah for the war he fought. Love has won, death has lost. Hallelujah for the souls he just for a moment. All right. Well, I got some announcements for you. Uh, so I'm just looking back, actually. We had a, a baby shower yesterday. I heard that was a really great event. There was three brand new moms and two moms on the way that we wanted to acknowledge. Um, but speaking of, we could use some help in the nursery now. <laughs> we, uh, I heard they were just booming last week. So if, if you can hold a baby safely and smile, maybe you're hard of hearing. This is a good job for you. <laughs> and uh, please let, seriously, though, we, we could use some help. And, and the schedule is like once a month, once a month. So if you can help out in the nursery once a month, that would be awesome. Uh, update to community barbecues. We're like, hey, we're going to have a big picnic here on 4th of July, but we want to get out into your neighborhood and let some of the people from here, and even, maybe even your neighbors, it's up to you if you want to invite them. Uh, we have some people that raised their hand and said, hey, I'll host. And so we're trying to give you a co-host that lives in your area. Uh, I'm having conversations with the host. They are picking dates. And so as early as next week, uh, possibly the week after, you're going to see some sheets up saying, hey, here's a barbecue in your neighborhood. Uh, sign up. Mention something that you'll bring. And uh, I know uh, we're, so we've got a host in Orchard Mesa, we've got a host in the Redlands, in Rural, Fruta, and Pro Fruta Proper, Loma, so more to come. Speaking of 4th of July, uh, we do want to offer the opportunity for those that want to be baptized to make their faith public. Uh, I want you to come see me. If you're like, if you've never been baptized, my, my philosophy is only true believers should be baptized. But every true believer should be baptized. You got to make it public. Okay, so if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ and you're trusting him for your salvation, but you've never been baptized, uh, stop by the office. Ask for a handout. I've got a handout, some scriptures with some questions. I want you to grab one of those and start reading that scripture, answer some questions. Let me know. Let, give me a chance to have a conversation with you about being baptized. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful event People are very encouraged by that. Uh, anybody know who Leonard Smith is? Anybody, raise your hand if you know who Leonard is. Yeah, how about that, huh? He's our back row guy. Uh, so be praying for him. The elders and Andy and Leonard, I gave them the opportunity to look through Hebrews 11. We've been working through the book of Hebrews together. And I gave them the opportunity to look through Hebrews 11 and pick a character that you would like to speak about, you would like to preach about. And... Uh, Tim Segrin's preaching today on Enoch, and Leonard's going to be preaching next week on Noah, uh, and, I get, and I get a chance to lead, try to fill in for Andy, right? So be praying for him. There's another thing that Leonard is doing is he used to be a missionary, as some of you, most of you know, 
and he is trying to help us do a better job of highlighting who our missionaries are. And so he's working on a plan to highlight a few missionaries each month, and then he's getting in touch with them, let them know, hey, we care about you, what's going on? But he could use an assistant, okay? Somebody to come alongside, has a heart for missions, or wants to grow and caring for our missionaries, to come alongside Leonard and be helpful to him. So just let, let the front desk know or come see me, or if you want to go right up to Leonard, that's fine too. Speaking of missions, how's my tan? It's like here and there, right? <laughs> here and there. Okay. Uh, thanks for praying for Rachel and I. Uh, we got a chance to go on a mission trip together last week um, down to Mexico. Or was it last week? Week before last. I got back last, the Sunday before last. Okay, this is getting messy. I'm sorry. Um, so we got a chance to go on a mission trip with some other people in town. Matter of fact, there was 56 people that went on this mission trip down to Ensenada, Mexico, south of Tijuana. Uh, we stayed at a YWAM base, and it's actually part of what we did was associated with them called Homes for Hope, where uh, the 56 of us split that group in half. We built two small houses in a day and a half. That was amazing. Day and a half, and then 16, you should have seen me. You would have been proud. I was wearing a tool belt. I know, a tool belt, and I, I felt like I needed it. That was the end thing, too. I was like, how do I look? You know, <laughs> I got a tool belt on. You know, but I was like, man, I need a tool belt because I'm, I'm a part of the roof crew, and I need this nail for that and the other nail. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, we're friends. Right? We're friends because I was like, what's this nail for? I had a holster for my hammer. It was really, I looked pretty good, pretty official. And so we got a chance to do that. We split the group in half, built two different houses, and then 16 of us, oh, I got to say something real quick. Day and a half, worked, worked hard. Fortunately, it wasn't too hot. You guys took the heat for us, and I appreciate that. I heard it was really hot here. But when we were all done, the family, we gathered up and stood on the concrete slab at the very beginning, and we prayed with the family that was going to receive this home. And then when we were all done, Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I'm just so focused on not falling off a roof, you know. And then all of a sudden, we're gathered up in front of this little house. And it looks amazingly different than what they were staying in. Um, and they pass the keys around to each and every person that worked on that house. And when you got that key, you got a chance to say something to the family. And the builder said, just offer a praise, give something thanks, a highlight, just real quick, say something to the family. And then it came all the way around, and then we presented the keys to the family. And uh, the guy that was in charge gave me the Hispanic Bible that I got a chance to present to them. But that, for me in that moment, it just felt like it was, it was just all worth it. Um, the Most of the group left on Thursday morning. Sixteen of us stayed to build a, a children's ministry addition onto a small church in the rural area. Um, we got a chance to interact some more with people through that. And then the following day, we went to a women's and children's shelter and just had a really great experience. Uh, we slapped together a really brief um, slideshow. And so I'm going to go ahead. Let's go ahead and just show that real quick. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one.
share some of my major highlights from the trip um, that I enjoyed the most. Um, just in general, working with a team of Christians, working alongside each other for the same purpose and the same reason, um, just really impacted me. Because um, we were there because we loved Jesus and we wanted to share his love in numerous ways. Um, I've never really felt an act of faith like this, like I've expressed my faith in certain ways, but being able to work really hard for, like, because of my faith and because um, I love these people was really, really cool. Um, there was so much meaning in it. Every single um, thing that we did and, and working hard, it wasn't just to get it done and accomplish it and finish the house. It was to serve a family that was in need um, and and while I was working on painting or trimming, just every little detail, it had so much meaning and purpose in it, and I, I felt so much love in it. I had um, I felt no selfish gain in it. I just felt like I was doing it for them, um, completely for them, and and for God as well. Um, after we finished the house, um, the son of the family that we were um, building the house for, his birthday was in a couple days, and um, he did not have a bed. And so the third day we were there, um, a group of us went on a little uh, grocery run, and we went to one of the stores and bought a mattress for him and bought some sheets and a comforter and some pillows. And then we went, to we went back to their house, to their new house, and put the mattress in his room 
and um, made the bed for him. And it was just so sweet seeing his reaction. Like he, he was very quiet, but he kind of walked in there and, and sat on his bed and just smiled up at us. And I could just tell how much it meant to him. Um, and it, it reminded me of how blessed we are to all have beds and he's never had one. And just being able to give him one was, was really, really cool. Um, I, the next day, w- they, a group of us um, built a Sunday school, like Gabby was saying, um, for one of the churches, we built a Sunday school room. Um, during that time, we went and bought the bed and stuff. But that night, we went to their church service. And it was different than I've ever experienced in probably one of the coolest worship services I've ever um, been to. No offense. Um, <laughs> 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 but... <laughs> um, I just, it was so different, and it was so cool to see their different culture and their passion for music as they were using, you know, different instruments and stuff, and we were just all clapping and almost dancing of just um, how excited everybody was and and their passion for it. Um, Even though I couldn't understand a word they were saying, I felt like I was worshiping with them. And that was really cool. Um, even though I wasn't singing, I just felt like I was worshiping with them. Um, and the last day we were there, we went to a women and children's shelter. They also had a like a school there. Um, but while we were there, I was I got to interact with the kids a lot more, and that was so fun and so cool. I got I, I played soccer with them a ton, and then um, we did some sidewalk chalk and. Just being able to interact with them, I felt so close to them. Even though I couldn't really talk to them or interact with them, of course, because we speak a different language, I, besides that fact, I felt so close to them as we, as we played with them. Um, and just, I loved those kids so much. <laughs> um, towards the end of our visit, the instructor, the lady that was kind of in charge, um, she gathered the kids in a circle, and we were around the kids, so they were in the middle of us, and um, she all told them to pick a person, and so I had, like, four or five kids just run up to me and give me a huge hug and, and grab my leg, and um, they stayed there as one of the seven-year-old girls prayed for us in, in Spanish, and so it, w- it was so cool, um, even though, you know, we couldn't understand what she was saying. It was so cool because she's so young, and she's praying for us. And um, afterwards, all the kids ran up and gave everybody a hug um, as we left. And that was just so cool. Like I said, I felt really close with them. Um, so, yeah, that's some of my major highlights from the trip. Pray with me, will you? Father, we pray for that family, that they, that the, the grace and mercy that they experienced and received, Lord, that that would, if they don't know, truly know you, Lord, that that would translate, that you would use that church and use the, the missionaries down there, Lord, to continue to follow up and to share this good news that would make so much more sense to them now because they, they know what grace is. They've gotten a little taste of grace, and Lord, we pray that that they would embrace the sacrifice that you made for a right relationship with you, and so we pray for that, Lord. Thank you, God, for the experience that you gave to Rachel and I, and thank you for my, thank you for my church that would pray for us and care for us while we were gone. Thank you, Lord. Receive our praise as we continue to lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. In this time of desperation, and all we There is only one foundation we believe, we believe in this broken generation, all is 
about who you are and you've given us descriptions of you that we can get to know and that we could sing about. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship, of praise, and receive our worship, Lord, as now we open our hearts and our minds to receive what you would have to say to us through your word and through whom you've appointed for this day. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I haven't done this for a while. I'm a little nervous. You ever been nervous? I, I talked to Ken Ward. He says he's never nervous. It's not true of any of us, I don't think. But welcome. Good to have you here this morning. If you're on internet and you're viewing, welcome to you. Uh, we trust that this will be a, an hour of uh, instruction for you that you'll uh, leave with something that you didn't come with, and that is a special blessing from the Lord. When Sylvia and I were first married, we lived in Manhattan, Kansas, and we'd, we had gotten married, and uh, we were married in, uh, in, in uh, Illinois, actually, and then we, uh, a week later, my sister got married in Kansas. That's a great way to drive your parents nuts, believe me. A week apart in three states, wow. Uh, but we took a short honeymoon to, to Colorado, uh, not this side of the mountains, but the other, and then went back and, and started school. Well, in that interim time, my parents had, had, had left Kansas and had gone into interim ministry, and so uh, we didn't know where they were going to be, but they ended up in, I believe the name of the town was Red Oak, Iowa. Anybody been to Red Oak, Iowa? <laughs> Anybody been to Iowa? <laughs> a few more of that. Well, anyway, it was, a, it was about a, I don't know, three to four hour ride from where we were living in Manhattan. And we decided to go up there for a, a long weekend with our parents. And um, Dad, uh, he, he was not Mr. Handy around the house. In fact, he had a, uh, just a one argument or one comment always, well, I don't have the tools. And 
you know, as we saw this morning, the slides, uh, you got to have a tool belt. You got to go out there with the tools and you got to get it done. And that's just what Pastor Sam did. Well, Dad didn't have the tools. Of course, he was traveling even less than he had before, and he didn't have much before. And so we went up there. He says, oh, I have something I need you to help me with. And so we would go down, the, down to the uh, hardware store and buy whatever he needed. I don't know what it was. So we got down there, and I parked alongside the curb, and uh, I got out of my side, and he got out of his side, and as I looked across the car, he wasn't there. Now, how could that happen? There was no time for him to get from the car over to the store, but he just plain vanished. And I thought, well, what is going on? So I walked around the end of the car, and there on the sidewalk, laying flat, was my dad. And he had gone, his legs were under the car, he's laying flat on the sidewalk, his hat had popped off the back, and he was just laying there, and he just kind of started to laugh. Thought, well, that's a good sign. So I rushed over to him and helped him up, and I says, what in the world happened? He says, well, I was getting out of the car, and there was ice along the curb. And as soon as I stepped on that ice, down I went. And it just took him in the neatest little pattern right under that car. Well, he didn't leave. God didn't take him home. Fortunate for me, it wasn't the rapture. I was still there. So we had a, a, a good chuckle, and uh, Dad is okay. Well, we're going to learn this morning about a man who had uh, something said about him that was quite unusual, and that is that he left this earth without dying. They looked for him, and he was not, for God took him. What an amazing thing. God took him. He wasn't here. So we're looking at uh, Hebrews. If you get this slide to work, not that button, maybe this button. Yeah, okay, if you can read that or not. But um, the Bible tells of the two people who left this earth without dying. It was the Enoch and Elijah. I'm going to talk about the two of them a little later. Uh, but the one we're talking about right now is, is Enoch. Hebrews 11.5, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Well, let's just look at this for a second. Enoch wasn't there. Now, can you imagine being in Enoch's household? Where's dad? I don't know, I haven't seen him. Did you see dad? No. Well, maybe he's out in the garage. I guess he didn't have garages then. Maybe he's out in the whatever. Haven't seen him. Have you seen dad? No. Have you seen grandpa? No. Nobody's seen him. Well, what happened to him? I don't know. He's not here. Now, I don't know how much they understood about what really happened to their, to their loved one, Enoch. What God revealed to them, I don't know. But it was written that he was there and he was taken. And there was no exit. There was no farewells. God just took him away. Well, that's uh, pretty amazing. But in that process, there's a word that comes out here. And it says... He was commended as having pleased God. Now, when we talk about commended, it's not a word we you really use a whole lot, but what does it mean? It said in Hebrews 11.2, the verse says, for, for it by the people of old received their commendation. Receiving a commendation from God is for a faithful life. Now, if you have someone who has accomplished something, Maybe, maybe the group that went down to Mexico received a commendation from those people that they built a house for. I think they did. A commendation is someone who's accomplished something, a task or an event, and is recognized for what they did. And that certainly fit in, in the week that they spent down there. Well, that's how God viewed Enoch. He viewed him as someone who had, who had uh, been commended by him. Now, Enoch was no more because God took him away. There are 
two doors to heaven. And we don't think of the one so much as the other. But I want to read you something here. Having someone disappear suddenly is out of the ordinary. There are two doors to heaven. Those who die and live yet by way of being raised up on the other side of death. And those who are alive at Christ's coming and are simply carried into the bliss of eternal life from experiencing death. Now there have not been too many who have just vanished from life. We know about two. Just two, Enoch and Elijah. But there is going to be a time when many are going to disappear. Amen. It's called the rapture. So there's two ways to, come, to get out of this life. Either you're going to die or you're going to be raptured. It's not likely we're going to have anybody disappear in the way that Enoch did. Now it could happen, but it probably won't. We're in a, in a different day, a different era uh, in, in God's word. So we're looking for the rapture. We want to go the way Enoch did without going through the door of death. That may not be our choice, but in any event, we should be ready. That is the whole thing. Now, Enoch is kind of an interesting character in history, uh, and they say, well, there, there is a book of Enoch. I, I haven't read it, but I know about it, and, and I know it's a, a, a very well-considered document or writing, and it had to do with a lot of earthly living and, and God... Uh, uh, recognizing who God is in your life. So these writings have, have been out there for a long time. Uh, but there's, there's, uh, there's some real uh, question about the authenticity of it. So the text wasn't put into what they call the canon. The, the biblical canon or the books that were accepted as legitimate books for the Bible. So it, was, it did not appear in there. But in fact, it may have been written in the 5th century by a uh, historian in, in, uh, in Israel. Now, if it's someone in the 5th century writing about Enoch, it's a good chance he didn't know him personally. <laughs> Pretty good chance. So that writing was somewhat speculative, but in, in, there is still something about that writing, and we're going to see later that that writing was used by one of the New Testament authors uh, by Jude. And I'm getting slippery up here. I don't know what's going on. I'm, uh, I'm not in balance. Anyway, um, Genesis 5.24 said, Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more, because God took him away. Well, someone doesn't just disappear because. And in the case of Enoch, that's true. Enoch just wasn't a person that God decided to take from the earth for, for no reason. There was a reason. It's a very important reason. The reason that God took him was that he was pleasing God. He was living his life in such a way that God was pleased with him. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that, what that means, what that means in our lives, to please God. Because if Enoch lived to please God, what does that say about us? Shouldn't we live the same way? I believe we should. And that's, that is our, our task, that is our assignment as, as his children. So we want to seek him, we want God to accept us, and then we want our action toward God to be our, based on our faith in him. Well, let's look a little more about who this Enoch guy was. He was in the seventh generation from Adam. So we have seven generations, and then Adam appears on the scene. So in that time period, uh, Adam was more than likely still living because Adam lived 930 years. And so Enoch was born before Adam died. So that being the case, there is something here that we need to think about, and I had never really thought about this before I started this study, and that is, if Enoch was still alive, when, or if Enoch was alive, when Adam was alive, then Adam became his great, 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 I'll say it, six times grandfather. So there was a relationship there, an earthly relationship, that probably existed. So after 1,056 years had passed, uh, Noah was born. And in that time, 
from the time of Noah until the time that God stepped in to punish sin in the world was it less than 1,500 years. From the very time Adam was born until Noah built the ark and floated away. Well, Moses, Abraham, Noah, Enoch are all mentioned as pleasing God. You know, when I, when I see that name Moses, that reminds me, there was a guy in the Old Testament, his name was Moses, and that's the one he's talking about. Former President Bush was in the airport, and as he was standing there and getting ready for his next flight, he looked over and there was a man standing there. He had a long white beard, he had a robe on, and he was carrying a shepherd's staff. And the president, being a friendly guy, but also curious, he went up to the man. He says, uh, Could I speak to you? The guy says, didn't, didn't answer. He said, uh, You have a long white beard, you have a robe on, and you're holding a staff. Would you be Moses? And the man didn't answer. He just stood there, looked straight ahead. So the president went back and sat down, and he looked over again. He was just, this really bugged him. So he walked back over there, and he said to him, you have a long white beard. You have a robe on. You have a shepherd's staff. Are you Moses? The man just looked straight ahead, didn't, didn't look at him at all. So the president turned around, and he walked back where he was, and just kind of shaking his head. Sir, secret service man came up to him, and he said, uh, well, what's bothering you? What's going on? He said, well, the, uh, this, this man over here, he looks like Moses. And, and I went up to him and asked him if he was, and he won't talk to me. He just looked the other way. Well, I'll talk to him. So he did. He walked up to him, and he says, uh, we've been observing you, and you're standing here. You've got a long white beard, and you've got a robe, and you've got the shepherd's staff, and you sure look like Moses. Are you Moses? president wants to know. He slowly turned, he looked at him, he says, the last time I talked to a bush, I went out in the wilderness for 40 years. <laughs> Wasn't going to take that chance again. <laughs> Poor George Bush. People still making fun of him. Well, what we see here is in 10 generations, the world has so deteriorated that God did send the flood. But in the middle of this, there was Enoch. Before the flood, there was a man who was living his life in honoring of God. So, in 10 generations, the world was destroyed. That's something to think about, 10 generations. We have to say that, uh, Enoch was an anomaly in his time. I, I've been thinking about, really, the world that Enoch lived in, how, how terrible was it? You know, there were two, two lines of, of people that came up after uh, Cain killed Abel. Uh, Seth came on the scene. He was the third uh, son of Adam and Eve. And Seth was carrying the godly line. In other words, it was through Seth that righteous people were going to be living. And there were, over the years, apparently some. Don't know how many. On the other side, there was Cain. Cain was rebellious. He was rebellious toward God. He wanted nothing to do with God. He was very vocal about it, and he generated a whole group of people following him who took the same line. Rejection of God. He didn't want anything to do with God. But in the middle of all this is Enoch, uniquely serving God. So we look in the, uh, the genealogy here of um, where, where uh, Enoch came. And I said he was seven generations, and he was also then in the line of Christ. If you go back in general, the genealogy of Christ in Luke 3.37, we find that um, 
He's listed there as in the path, in the, in the line of Christ through Joseph, the earthly father of Christ. And so this man just didn't pass off the scene for no reason. God used him to generate a, 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 uh, a line that would include the Messiah through his son, uh, or father Joseph. Um, I am a slide or two off here. Don't know. Excuse me while I get myself caught up. Okay, there we are. In Jude 1, 14 to 16, I'd like to read what was said about Enoch by Jude. Now, where did Jude get this information? We don't know. But there was this writing that was called Enoch. It may have included him. Uh, it might have included what, what uh, Judah found in researching Enoch. It says this, it was about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied or preached, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of the, all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which God, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, following, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Tremendous insight by Enoch about what God is going to do in judging sin. I don't know how Enoch knew this. And I don't know how God revealed it to him. But he did. And I don't know how these words were preserved. So that when Judah wrote his book in the New Testament, he knew about them and used them as a tribute to Enoch. So there's a warning here. There's a warning for us today that um, we need to heed what Enoch said way back, way back before the flood. And those warnings are still good today. Now, all the things he said about the ungodly deeds, the ungodly people, all of that was a judgment that came with a flood. But there is yet another judgment that will happen in the end times when God will judge all men for the sin that they had in rejecting him. The ultimate sin, of course, is rejecting Christ. So this is a, an insight that um, Enoch had that we're really a little puzzled about how he got it. But God gave it to him. We know that. Okay, I've got to find my place. I think we're about there. Okay. Now the thing about Enoch was that uh, he he had he had faith in uh, in what God is going to do in his life and in others. I still don't know where I am. Somebody got into my somebody got into my stuff here, and that wasn't very nice. Okay. There's speculation. When you look at Revelation 11.2, there are two witnesses that are going to take place in Israel and minister to the world. And it says in Revelation 11.2, I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. The beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw him. You know, years ago, you looked at this and said, well, how, how can this be that these two witnesses would be in Israel, and yet the whole world would see them prophesying and talking and preaching in the streets of Jerusalem? How could that be? Well, enter television. Wonders of wonders, that little blue tube that we all have in our homes, it's going to let us see what is going on around the world. And as it is even possible today. So this is how it's going to happen. 
we know that the world is going to see it. And there are two who are going to be evangelists that are going to do this. Well, there are two people who don't die naturally. Enoch and Elijah. Are these the two guys? You tell me. I don't know. But it's speculation that it could be. Because then they do die. They die after their witness in Jerusalem and after God uses them to to reach that world, they are killed. The enemy finally kills them. And because there are so many who are so angry with them, they leave their bodies out in public, out where they can be seen. Again, television cameras show this all over the world. Here they are. We won. We won. They're dead. These guys are gone until the third day. And all of a sudden, up they come. They stand up, look around, and they start preaching again. And then finally God says, come on up, guys. Come on up. It's all done. We're going to judge the world. This is the place that God is going to put the world in in the days that are ahead. It doesn't matter if Enoch is one of those two witnesses. What matters is that they are going to be there to witness and they're going to reach their world. And the world is going to see and hear the gospel. And again, they'll have the opportunity to accept or reject Jesus Christ. So, if that is Enoch, we don't know. But, could well be. What was so different about Enoch that God took him from a sinful world? Hebrews 11, 5 and 6, that's been our text. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. We already covered that. Now look at verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We have to seek God. We have to find out what it is that God wants from us. He is giving himself to us. What does he want in turn from us? He wants our faith. He wants us to place our faith in himself through Christ. So what does that mean to put our faith in God? There must be some meaning to that. Well, yes, there is. Enoch is our example of faith. He had visible faith. Other people knew what Enoch believed. They didn't accept it, but they heard it, and they knew what he believed. That's what we need to be with people, too. They need to know what we believe. Enoch learned from others, as we've already stated. It could have been Adam. We don't know who taught Enoch and where he got all his teaching, but he had it, and he lived it. And perhaps Adam explained to Enoch what he left. He left a beautiful garden, a perfect garden. It was wonderful. But he sinned. And the result of sin put Adam and Eve out of the garden. Therefore, Adam might have told him it was a high cost of sin. Not only did it lose him his future with God, but it gave him a hard life here. Everything became hard. Work was hard. The ground was hard. Hard, everything was hard. And that's the life that Adam made for himself because of sin. And knowing all this, Enoch preached to the world that there is a way out. It is through the love of God. And he had the faith that God would work in his life as we should have in our lives. There are some verses that deal with faith. Colossians 1.16 For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created for him and through him. And Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. You know, another verse, Isaiah 40.26, Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. 
And then Romans 1.20, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. That's way back to Enoch's time. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So many people seem to be worried about, well, what about the, the, the lost? What about the, the people in other countries who never heard? What about the, the heathen as it was? You know, it's, is, is God fair? Is God going to judge them even though they've never really heard about Christ or even about God? Is that, is that really going to happen? Yes. Yes, it is right here. You don't need any other witness before you than what God has already given in the nature around us. We live here in the valley. Do we have a beautiful place to live? Yes. Did it just happen? No. God created it. And it's for our enjoyment, for our benefit. That speaks to us about a holy God. We have a choice of either accepting or rejecting the source of all that's around us. And unfortunately, there are many who still reject it. Their will gets in the way. Someone's still messing around with me. Who is it? Pastor Sam, what did you do to me? <laughs> So what does it mean to walk with God? That's the thing that Enoch was commended for, his walk with God. God looks at our hearts, and he knows us. Others may think we walk with him, but only God sees the heart. We can fool other people, but we can't fool God. Enoch was in harmony with God, and our Bible tells us Noah and Enoch, Enoch and Noah walked with God. You know, there is no room for easy believism. We, we hear about that so much today. Well, you know, you, you, just, have to, you just, just, just have to believe and everything will be okay. And, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do. You just go ahead and live your life. Uh, you know, no one's going to tell you what's right or wrong, so forth. That's not true. That's not true. God demands us to have our faith placed in him in a proper way. And Hebrew 11, 5 says, without faith it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. There is a seeking in our part toward God. If we're going to know God, then we will please him. But if we don't seek him and we don't know him, God will not be pleased. So, it's, it's not just a matter of, of seeking, it's a diligent seeking. It's, a, it's seeking of all of our being, all of our effort, all of our, tr all of our trying will lead to that relationship. So what is real faith? I'd like to read a, a, a definition to you. It was put together by a, a guy by the name of, what was his name here? Um, Pastor, Dennis Lee, pastor of Living Waters Fellowship. And this is, a, this is worth considering because I think it says so much to us about real Christian living and honoring God. It says there are so many so-called Christians who know all about submission, but they're unwilling to submit. They know all about honesty, but their daily lives are far from being honest. They know all there is to know about forgiveness, but haven't helped the person that does them wrong. They say they believe God's word, but they don't follow it. And so they end up substituting knowledge, knowledge for a relationship. He goes on to say, but when we understand this relationship, then we'll want to give grace because of the grace God has given us. We we'll want to lay down our lives because Jesus laid down his life for us. And we'll want to forgive others because of how much God has forgiven us. This is not a religious thing. It's a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And 
And when we have that relationship, then we will hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I think that sums it up very well. That says really what it's about. There isn't any room for artificial, for pretending, for fooling, thinking other people are going to think more of you than you are. God sees the heart. He sees exactly who we are, and he's going to test us in that relationship. Well, where are you? Is your relationship real and known by God, or are you just fooling yourself and others? Honesty with God begins by receiving his invitation to know him and please him in our living. Here's the path that we must follow. In conclusion, we first of all must know and understand God's truth. Where we find God's truth, we find it in his word. We find it in the lives of other believers. We find it because we seek it. The second thing we have to do is repent of our sin. You know that word sin? Not very popular today. Don't hear it much. In fact, our society has just kind of done away with it. We don't believe in that anymore. Well, you know, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean because we say it isn't there, it isn't there. No, sin is real. And it's in every one of our lives. And we need to confess it to our Lord. The third thing we need to do is submit to the Lord. Submit to his will in our lives. It's one thing to know him. One thing to be forgiven. But that doesn't mean that we're submitting our lives to him to live for him totally, completely. But that's what he wants. And then finally, be willing to obey his will and his word. And I might add that means serving him. We should serve him out of love, of a love of a life of, of uh, service due to our love for our Lord Jesus Christ. What did you hear as, as uh, Rachel talked about it this morning? The love that she felt with those people was real. It was from their hearts. And they sensed the love in, in the team that went. That love was real. It was put there by their relationship with Christ. So I know where it finds you this morning. I find Enoch is a pretty tough guy to follow. He, uh, he set a pretty high bar. I, I don't understand how out of that sinful world, in 1,500 years, God could destroy the world that he made. How long has it been since the flood? Well, we're in year 2000. And that's A.D. after Christ after Christ's birth. We have a total maybe of 7,500 years since the flood. Is God patient? Oh well, we're we're better than, than they were back then. No, you weren't. <laughs> you weren't better. We're, they were sinners. We've all I've been sinners. I hope we're no longer sinners, that we have submitted our lives to Christ. Father, as we come this morning, we want to take the example of Enoch with us. He was an anomaly. He stood out, and he stood alone. We don't even know he reached his family. And perhaps you took him from this earth, being the only one who was serving you, so he wouldn't have to go through the flood. We don't know. But we know his life was worthwhile. It was noticed by you. You rewarded him. You took him home with you. You watered him there. Don't know how long it will be for. We'll all be home with you too. It could be through death. It could be through the rapture. But we know it's going to happen. Speak to our hearts this morning, Lord. We thank you for it all in your name. Amen. Feel free to stand with me as we close our service with praise.
I see the work of your hands Galaxies spinning, oh heavenly dance Oh God, all that you are so overwhelming And I hear the sound of your voice All at once it's a gentle and thundering noise Oh God all that you are so overwhelming I delight myself in you captivated by your beauty I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you God I Shame because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. I know the power of your cross, forgiven and free forever. You'll be my God. All that you've done is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed. Jesus prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, and to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Father, we thank you for this time that we could worship you in song and in prayer and in word, and now in fellowship. Lord, we pray that we pleased you today. Our desires that we please the, our God. We thank you, Lord, and you know we need your help to do that too. And you help us. You draw us near and your son Jesus intercedes for us. And so we thank you, Lord, for the great grace that we can come before you with confidence because of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, 
Thank you, Lord, for ministering to us to this day and letting us minister to you and to each other. We praise you. Go with us now, Lord. We've gathered, and now we're about ready to scatter. We pray, Father, help us to be the church to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.